Good morning, congregation of the Most High. I am always thankful for this congregation for giving me the opportunity to stand before you to bring to you the living word of God that may be able to feed our souls nourishment for our bodies, health to our mind. We want to go to our Father in prayer at this point in time. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your son who came as a representation of you, Yahweh in the flesh. Father, we just ask that you would be with the minister that has been selected here, that you would uh, make sure that the procedure that he is in at this point in time would work out for the betterment of this congregation here, White Road. Father, we also wanna pray for the sick of this congregation and all the congregations throughout the land, Father. We pray that you would strengthen each and every one and give them the ability to obtain good health. Father, we ask that you would send your rivers, the clouds, Heavenly Father, that may rain upon California for we so badly need it, Father. Father God, I ask that you would forgive us for our sins and our transgressions and cleanse us by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, dealing with uh, the universe, there is the problem that is called the singularity problem. We understand that everything has a beginning. So that goes for the universe. The universe is not eternal. But the scripture says that in St. John chapter one and verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. In Genesis chapter one and verse one, we understand that the word says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in John chapter four in verse 24, we understand that God is spirit. So what we have here is a spirit being that created a material universe. And he gets involved with his universe and the economy of his universe. Massive is the universe. So you just think about the grandeur of the universe and how large it is and God's responsibility to make sure that everything goes according to his plan and his purpose. Today's lesson is God is Yahweh. So when we see the title God, we must understand that that is Elohim. When we see the term Lord, we must understand that that is Jehovah in the English. That's how that works. So. The Elohim is Yahweh, which is the creator whom Jesus Christ came in the flesh of that. So we had in the hearing of your reading concerning what the Lord told Moses to do. Okay. So there are three things that Yahweh will do to Egypt. Three. He says in Exodus 3 and 20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do to it. After that, he will let you go. 
So the first thing is he's going to hit them with wonders. Next, in chapter 4 and verse 8, if they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. So the next thing he's going to do is he's going to hit them with signs. And then in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. So what God does is threefold. When we look in Jeremiah chapter 24 and verse 10, we understand that the Lord is going to hit them with the sword, famine, and pestilence. Again, all that the sword doesn't kill, they are taken into captivity. Famine, wherever there is famine, there is pestilence, drought, a lack of food and things of that nature so what we are seeing here is the power and the control of the almighty so he says i will smite egypt with all my wonders which i will do in the midst thereof shows how he gets involved with his creation With those wondrous plagues, the amazing effects of his almighty power, which were wrought by him in the midst of Egypt, by which their land, their rivers, their persons, and their cattle were smitten. Right? That they will believe, remember, that he said concerning believe the words, the voice of the latter sign, which he had a voice in it commanding belief that he was a messenger of God. The first sign respects his rod, the other his hand. God often said that he will do wondrous things by his mighty hand and with great judgments. You see, upon the Egyptians by many and sore plagues and punishments inflicted on them. So that brings us to Isaiah 42 and 8. I am the Lord. That is my name, not God. That's not my name. My name is Yahweh. My glory I give to no other, nor my praises to carved idols. You know, Yahweh has a great way of showing us things. While I was being taught the other day, says, how would you like to be called by another name other than the name that you go by? Hey, Mark, Mark, Mark. You see, this is how Yahweh feels. What are you calling me? That's not my name. He says, that is my name, Yahweh. When you see Lord, that's Yahweh. The translator translated it because it's, oh, this name is so, so holy and great. We can't use this name. We have to use some other terminology. No, use my name. Exodus 3 and 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord Yahweh, the God Elohim, the creator of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. What do you think? 
The Elohim don't want you to know his name. Who is the creator? Who is Yahweh? Why do you say God? Who are you talking to? You could be praising and talking to any God, right? But it's capitalized. So I guess through learning, we understand that he is talking about the creator. But we must understand that we don't go by Mark when my name is Will. Right? right. Psalms 8318, that you may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, no, is Yahweh, or the most high Elion over all the earth. So we must get into the habit of calling the Elohim, the creator, by his rightful name. Not God. It's a title. The second encounter Moses had, what goes on on Yahweh's side, we see in uh, chapter 8, chapter 7, verses 8 through 14, where Moses is given instructions concerning the things that he must do when he go before Pharaoh. Starting at verse eight, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men and, and sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refused to let the people go. You see, when dealing with this sign that Yahweh showed, before Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron was that one staff, one rod. Magicians means many. So you have, they don't give us a number, but more than one. And Aaron's rod swallowed up the magician's rods. What are we getting from this? In Genesis chapter 49 and verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. No matter what happened to Joseph, he overcame. Why? Because he was blessed by the Lord in everything that he did, he prospered. So Joseph, it's like branches that run over the wall, right? Vines. If you plant vines, if you don't keep those things trimmed or whatnot, unattended, it'll grow all over your house, out of control, right? So no matter what roadblock that we go through, hurdles or whatnot, we have the potential to overcome. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Can't do nothing against what Yahweh is trying to do. His process is in process all the time. He don't have to do one thing because of what this person does. No, he continues on with his purpose, and his plan and the desires of his heart. Colossians 13 and 8. For we cannot do anything against the truth, 
but only for the truth. You see, Pharaoh has to learn to understand this the hard way. Let us not have to learn things the hard way. You see, on Pharaoh's side, what Pharaoh depended on, verses 10 through 12, let us look at that again. Verses 10 through 12. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and, and did just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men and the sorcerers and they, the magicians of Egypt, did also did the same by their secret arts. So on Pharaoh's side, he has his sorcery through the magicians, right? Verse 11, then Pharaoh summoned, he summoned his uh, magicians of Egypt, secret arts, for such men, for each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs so the vine growing over the wall right jesus christ resurrecting from the dead right and not able to do anything against the truth before the truth that's where we are that's how the gospel of our lord and savior jesus christ Paul says in Romans chapter one and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then also to the Greek. So we must understand that the power of Yahweh is at work right now. The 10 plagues that they had to deal with were in groups. The plants consist of the first group, blood, frogs, and lice. The second group, flies, murrain, and boils. The third group, hell, locusts, and darkness. And then finally, the last group, the killing of the firstborn. See, each plague got worse and worse and worse see pharaoh was a stubborn man it wasn't that his heart was hardened because when we look at the way that that word harden is translated it's stubborn you see what's happening to your kingdom and you thought that you were the almighty the creator but now you're finding out you're just a man so he's having problems with accepting that, the issues that comes from the second uh, encounter with Pharaoh is in uh, verses 13 and 14 of uh, chapter seven. So we see Pharaoh had an issue with his heart. And that issue was that he would not submit or listen to the word of Yahweh, you see. So he refused to let pe the people of Egypt go. And then the third encounter. No time for relaxation, buddy. You know, a lot of times when we have problems in our lives, we try to get away from them and, and just try to exhale and say, you know what, let me go and relax. Not a time for that. As Pharaoh is going to find out that it's not a time for relaxation right now when all of this is going on right before your eyes. Now you wanna to try to, you know, not accept it. Exodus 7 and 15, go to Pharaoh in the morning, Yahweh tells Moses, as he is going out to the water. 
stand, stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. You know, when Moses, when Yahweh appeared to Moses in chapter four, in verse two, in verse one, the Lord says he's going to send him to the children of, of Egypt, send him to Pharaoh. Moses said, uh, what if they don't believe me? What if they ask me, what if they say, uh, you didn't appear to me? So Yahweh asked him, what is that in your hand? He says, a rod or a staff. Yahweh says, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. What did Moses do? He took off running. Man, I'm getting away from that snake. I would have ran too. Dealing with snakes. So the Lord said to Moses, reach out your arm and take it by the tail. And it became a rod in his hand. So he prepared him for that very moment when it would turn into a serpent. You see? No time for relaxation, Pharaoh. In 8 and 20, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. You see, Pharaoh keep wanting to go and relax at the water. Oh, yeah, this is nice and wonderful. While his kingdom is about to be desolated, right? Exodus 9 and 13, then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. He hardened his heart, right? As the scripture says, which is being stubborn. So, Interruption. Again, when you're trying to get some relaxation, when you have turmoil going on right before you, it's going to be interrupted. It's going to be interrupted. Yahweh's intention was to let Pharaoh know that this is not the time to relax. When you have problems going on in your life, it is not a time to relax. We need to focus on the problem at hand and address it. And if that was the case, for going to the now, Moses and Aaron ruined that. Yahweh wanted to let him know that, buddy, this is not the time for you to be coming down here, wiggling your toes in the water or bathing or whatever you're doing. It's not going to happen. What Yahweh is trying to do is to get Pharaoh to see that Egypt was not a life of rest and enjoyment, but a life of blood. When the good, great one said, take some dust or some water from the Nile and throw it on the dry land, it's going to turn to blood. So what you're living in right now is a land of blood. Remember the first plague was blood. Remember that. So the people of the world today is drinking blood, death. You see, when the Lord struck the now with blood. They had nowhere to drink for how long? One week. Imagine going a week with no water to drink. You see? So it is with the land of Egypt is being terrorized by 
signs and wonders and judgment. So we who are in this land today, on this planet today, if you have not submitted yourself to the Lord, the gospel, the eternal gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and repent and be baptized by a member of the body of Christ, the church of Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. You see, me and my wife had a discussion this morning. And Buddha, the religion came up. So I said, all of these other congregations, you know, Jehovah's Witness, Presbyterians, uh, Baptists, Protestants, Methodists. I said, what a, look at Buddha, 500 years BC. I said, okay, I, I can ask, I can get some understanding out of that. Older than the body of Christ, right? But the scripture said that the Almighty, Yahweh, the creator, allowed man to walk in their own way. So man at that time, before the scriptures, said repent and, and be baptized into the Lord. They did whatever they wanted to do. You cannot do what you want to do anymore. Because you're, you're, you're drinking blood. Death. You're in death. So now when we talk about the Jehovah's Witness and all of those other bodies, Christ's establishment has been around almost 2,000 years, you see? So what we have here is an after effect of what? 1,400, 1,500 years later, 1,600 years later, you have all of these other congregations coming. But there is only one true one just like Yahweh has only one true name, you see? So if you have not accepted the gospel, if you have not been baptized into the body of Christ for forgiveness of sins, we have water right here that we can baptize you into the body of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for this opportunity in which you have given me here, uh, White Road Congregation.